Hi, and welcome to the first of six National Jewish Book Club online talks. I'm Miri pomerantz Dauber. I'm the director of Jewish Book Council's Book Club Department, and I'm here with author Molly Antipal. Quick note about Jewish Book Council. Jewish Book Council is a not-for-profit organization um, that focuses on promotion of books of Jewish interest, and we do that through a number of different programs. You can find out more about us at jewishbookcouncil.org. And I'm here with Molly Antipal. Um, who is one of our 16 National Jewish Book Club selections for this year. The National Jewish Book Club is a new program of JBC's Book Club Department. Every year, Jewish Book Council will be selecting 16 titles, both fiction and nonfiction, from the breadth of Jewish literature. These titles are presented in a guide with information on each book and discussion questions, so something of a book club in the box. For more information, you can visit the book club section of JBC's website. The program is designed to allow participants to engage with books in the way that interests them most, and includes this series of six online conversations, as well as personal video chats with book clubs um, at a book club's own invitation. And now Molly Antipal, whose book, The Un-Americans, is one of our inaugural fiction selections. Molly's debut story collection, The Un-Americans, published by W.W. Norton, was long listed for the 2014 National Book Award and received a 5 under 35 award from the National Book Foundation. The book is a Barnes & Noble Discover Great New Writer selection and an Indie Next and Indies Introduced New Voices pick. Her writing has appeared or is forthcoming on NPR's This American Life and All Things Considered, online at The New Yorker, and in many periodicals, including The New Republic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, San Francisco Chronicle, Elle, Echo Tone, Oxford American, One Story, and American Short Fiction. She teaches creative writing at Stanford University, where she is a Wallace Stegner Fellow and is at work on the novel. Molly lives in San Francisco, so we're doing this as a bi-coastal conversation. Molly, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Mary. I'm really happy to be a part of this. Is this your first online conversation? I'm sure you've done many, many discussions with groups across the country. Um, I've done a lot of in-person discussions. I think this is my third or fourth online discussion. But the first time on Google+, I've done it on Skype only. Great. Um, so, starting at the beginning, I suppose, the title, The Un-Americans. What does that mean to you? While some of the stories focus on McCarthyism and the Red Scare, which many people associate with the term un-American, is in the House of Un-American Activities, um, many, some of them seemingly have very little to do with anything around that time period. Um, so do you feel like the title applies to all of the stories, or just some of the stories, does it create um, a narrative for the entire collection? Um, my hope was that it would create a narrative for the entire collection. Um, when I first, the, the book took me 10 years to write, and the first stories that I worked on um, were very much inspired by my family history, um, notably um, my grandparents' involvement in the Communist Party. And so for me, the word un American was exactly what you said. Like it brought up the Red Scare, it brought up, you know, it brought up McCarthyism, and that was always the way that I had, um, that I had. Th thought about the term, but as I was writing, and I should say that I had no idea what the title was until I was done with the book, like I just felt like I, I shouldn't have that sort of thematic question in my mind as I was working, um, but but as I, as I was writing I started to think about for my East European characters, um, many of whom are banned writers and banned artists, dissidents and academics, and what it means to essentially risk their lives for their politics in their mother countries. Um, to end up coming to America. And I wondered if for some of these characters they might have had a niggling feeling of nostalgia for these bleak times that they left simply because they held a significant place in, you know, in that part of history. And then, um, and then in my Israel stories, which is like the, another third of the book, I was really interested, and again this was something that I really only thought about once I was done with the stories, but I was so interested in this kind of um, very complicated and almost symbiotic relationship that um, this current generation of Israelis um, have to have to the United States. Um, so, for example, I have one um, I have one Israeli um, character who feels really conflicted about his military duty in the West Bank, but he's still um, you know where he's guarding a settlement filled with a number of um, you know of American religious settlers, but he still just pines for a chance to visit America for himself and to really just get to experience it on his own. Um, or for another character, um, an Israeli journalist, her life is basically upended when um, after America's most recent economic meltdown happens and, it, and I was just really interested in how that might affect her own life. And so it was just this idea of for some of the stories it was that very 
basic, you know, the, this idea of the Red Scare and McCarthyism, and for other ones, it was just this like basic idea of what does the word American and un-American mean to these characters. So for many of your characters, um, or at least some of them, they were not around um, during the 50s and during McCarthyism. Um, they weren't yet alive, they're younger people. Um, and in many of your stories, um, you have an older generation who's looking forward and trying to avoid the past in a lot of ways, and a younger generation that's looking, to the, um, looking back to the past um, and trying to desperately find roots or um, sort of a context for their family histories. Is that something that you've noticed in your own life? Is that something that you see around you, either in your students or in a lot of the literature you're reading? Totally. Um, I feel like that's probably the most autobiographical aspect of the book is I think I've just always been that that kid who was so interested in the past and was so interested in these parts of my family history that I hadn't lived through. And um, and it was only as I got older and I started to, to you know, be a writer that I thought, wow, this is a really interesting um, tension in my family that some people who have, you know, I mean, I have had such an easier life than my grandparents and obviously than my great grandparents and, and my parents. And what is it about me that is so fascinated by these dark periods of history that I didn't live through when many members of the older generation would just choose to either deal with those dark um, those dark moments through, through humor and what is it about me as a storyteller and as and and as, as part of this generation that is so interested in these moments in history and that was something um, in the story my grandmother tells me the story which is um, about partisan fighters right outside of the village of Antipole in Belarus which is where my family came from that was something that I, I realized I was so aware of in that story and then I noticed that it kind of rippled throughout the other stories which is what does it mean for someone of, of this generation to just be so fascinated by these really bleak moments in history that I have been lucky enough not to have to live through? And what does that what does that do to these um, to these older generations of my family? In terms of making them go back and recount it, or just in terms of sort of where your mindset is versus theirs? My mindset is versus theirs, making them go back and recount it. Um, thinking about all the different ways that people deal with these. With, with very bleak moments that they lived through, you know, for some people it's not wanting to talk about it at all, for other people, for a lot of people in my family, it's finding a way to, to sort of search for the funny, you know, to, to search for the humorous story and something. Um, and so it, all of that I found as I was writing just really informed my storytelling, these ideas, you know, just this entire way that everyone deals with the past. Great. And how long did it take you, these stories were written over a period of how many years and where they originally perceived as a collection or stories that developed into a collection? They developed into a collection. Um, the first story I wrote, um, which was Duck and Cover, um, the story about the young girl in the McCarthy era, that I wrote um, 10 years before the book was published. And I worked pretty consistently on the book for those 10 years. But in that decade, I was also just learning how to write. You know, I was learning how to write a scene. I was learning how to write the kind of dialogue that I wanted to. And so over that course of 10 years, I wrote so many other stories that didn't make it into the book, um, but I just felt like I was really just trying to learn how to do it. And w to be honest, when I was writing, I wondered how this book was going to come together because so many of my favorite story collections are very much linked by um, a specific voice or by setting or by character. And I thought, oh my gosh, like these stories, you know, move from the present, you know, back into history. They cross three continents. You know, they're narrated by men and women, young, old, American, European, Israeli, and I worried sort of what would be the connective tissue to the book. And but what I realized, like once I was almost done with the book, is that they weren't threaded together by place and they weren't threaded together um, by character, but rather by a question that just kept popping up for me like over and over and over as I wrote. And the question was, you know, what happens if the thing that you've dedicated your entire life to loses relevance in the course of world events? And what do you do with yourself after that? And once I realized that that, you know, whether for some of my characters it's fighting communism or it's joining communism or it's, um, you know, or it's becoming more religious and what that does to their secular relatives, like all of these questions that I had, once I figured out like what that thematic ripple was, then I was also really able to think about with that question in mind, like how does it affect the people closest to us? Like what if we're trying so hard to make the world a better place? Is it sometimes possible to not notice what's actually happening to the people closest to us? And again, like once I had those themes, then I thought, okay, this book is really coming together in a way that 
that works for me. But I think that if I knew that while I was writing, it might have felt a little too engineered. It was almost like I just had to write the stories with my blinders on and then figure out how it was all coming together. So one of the questions I was going to ask you later was, what's a good discussion question for a book club when, when they're reading your book? And I think that that pretty much answered that question. That's a pretty good one. Um, how did you, when you were putting the collection together, since these were all disparate parts, how did you choose the order of the stories? And do you feel that the order that you chose creates the overarching narrative for the collection? Or is it um, more the combination of each element together that creates that theme? Oh, that's a really good question. It was so hard to put it together. Like once I knew all the, once I knew, okay, these are the stories that I want to put in the book. And um, I remember I was at an, I was at an artist residency in Wyoming, and I had this really big open. And I would lay all the stories on the floor, and every day I'd walk into the studio and kind of like stare at the stories and shuffle them around and just try to imagine what they would um like how the order would change. And I think I did it. I think I did every possible order in that month. And and then my editor and I had a phone call that was incredibly useful and really kind of life-changing for me. I mean, it really was. Um, we were talking about the order of the stories, and, and I was telling her, like, at that moment, my preferred order. And I was really excited because there were certain stories that I felt had done some kind of interesting technical tricks that I had learned how to do. So I was really excited if there was, like, a point of view shift or something that was happening where my characters were changing setting really quickly and all these, like, very writerly, crafty things that I had just been so stuck in this book for so long that it seemed really interesting to me. And I remember she was quiet for a moment and then she said, Molly, this is the moment when you need to stop thinking about your book as a writer and start thinking about your book as a reader. And it was such like a light bulb moment for me because I had, like, I had been, like writing a book for so long and then putting it together can be such a myopic experience where I just am like this the whole time thinking about the book. And suddenly for the first time thinking like, oh, there are going to be all of these readers out there who have never, um, you know, been with these stories before and haven't thought about the things that I've been thinking about for these 10 years. And um, and it was really exciting to think like a reader for the first time as opposed to a writer. And so we decided that um, starting with what is sort of like a deceptively simple story, the old world, you know, it's chronological, it's in first person, it, um, in some ways on the outside it might just seem kind of like a, like a love story or a father-daughter story. And I like the idea of starting with something that... Um, well, it didn't feel simple to me when I was writing it. I could see that it could be kind of like an easy way to ease into the book. And then from there, once I knew that, then I was able to, to move forward. And I also, and another thing that we talked a lot about that was really useful is I loved the idea for my readers of um, getting the opportunity to switch locations from story to story. So, you know, if they're on, you know, if they're on the, you know, in the modern day Upper West Side in one story, what does it mean to go to a Moshav in Israel in the next story and then go to... World War II era Belarus, and like, what might that be like psychologically to, as a reader to have to hop around that much? And that felt kind of exciting to me. So, as you were mentioning, the um, stories in the Americans are written from many different perspectives. They're young and old, and male and female, and from different nationalities and different countries. And you were just talking about acquiring the perspective of the reader after being right. the writer for so long. How did you acquire those voices? Did you have to do research? Were they based on people you knew? Um, yeah, I mean, all of the stories took a ton of research. I think that's one of the reasons that the book took me so long. I think that, I mean, for all of the stories, I was doing so much sort of historical and political research, and and it was all stuff that I was just really interested in anyway, and that I was wanting to read about anyway. But once I realized, like, okay, I'm going to be writing about a, you know, a Czech dissident writer in the 1970s, that was like suddenly, you know, a year of my life would be reading everything I could get my hands on about that, you know, about that movement and about that time, and watching every documentary. Um, and then it's this funny thing with all that research of doing all of it and being so immersed in it. I, I love this research so much. And for most of the stories, I got travel grants and was able to travel to where I was writing about and visit archives and do a lot of interviews. And it was just like it was just like such a joy. Um, but then there was this really tricky thing as a writer of then making myself get rid of all of the research that would reveal itself to the reader. You know, because my goal as a writer is to make is to make what I've imagined feel very authentic and to hope and hopefully for the reader to forget that they're reading a story that someone in San Francisco spent a year researching, but that they're really swept up in the lives of these people. And so everything that didn't just inform the lives of my characters within the moments of the stories had to go. So I would say every one of these stories was probably 80 or 90 pages to begin with, and it was filled with so much research that I, as like the research nerd, found so intriguing, and I didn't get to keep it.
So all of that got shucked away. Um, but in, um, in response to the, the first part of your question, the voices, that part just comes so easily to me. It's like, I would say that's the one easy thing for me as a writer is figuring out voice. Like everything else is really challenging and kind of stressful when I'm doing it. But once I, once I can just sort of hear the rhythm of someone's voice and I can understand like their cadences and their pauses and, and what they choose to reveal and what they, um, and what they really, really don't want any, anyone to know, like once that voice is with me, then, then I understand the character. And, um, and oftentimes, my male characters, those voices come to me easier than my female characters. Do you feel like it's almost like acting? You know, you, you take on the character and then just act them on the page? That's exactly how it feels. It feels, writing in general feels so close to method acting to me. And I feel like for, you know, the 8 or 12 or 15 months that I'm working on a story, like, I will be thinking, I'll think, like, well, how would this narrator be responding to what happened to me um, in my class today? Or what would they think about this conversation I had with my mom last week? And, and I'm just constantly thinking about the way that they would process my own life. And so it's this person that kind of lives with me during the time that I'm writing the story. And that's interesting because then um, that helps me figure out their psychology, which as a writer is the most interesting thing to me. That's a lot of voices going on. Um, you're uh -huh. <laughs> novel right now, how is that different from writing the short stories? I imagine that it, it could be fewer voices, but it could be more voices at one time than when you're writing the stories. Um, I mean, it's, it's an early, it's, I'm in the early stages, and so it's still kind of like the honeymoon period, and it feels really fun, but I will say that I was in the honeymoon period with every one of these stories, and then I would hit like a wall and not know how to get get beyond it for months. So right now it's going well. I do think that's something that's been really great is just, you know, since my book came out, so, you know, for the past, like, you know, nine months, I've been able completely just to wake up every morning and think about one world, like the world of this novel, and not think about researching these really disparate places or people. And I just kind of wake up thinking about the same set of characters, and that's been really satisfying. That's great. We're definitely looking forward to the novel. Um, oh, and thank you. We, we won't ask you when it's coming out, because I know that that's always... Um, I have no idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, one of the stories, the one that you wrote first, Duck and Cover, Judy the narrator says that some of the choices, that sometimes some choices are just made for you, and, and that's that. Is that something that you believe, or and do you think other characters in this collection would feel the same way? Because a lot of them really are dealing with difficult choices that they're making as choices. I think so. I mean, I think that's really true for, for Judy. And, you know, for anyone who hasn't read the story, she's um, a teenage girl who's grown up in a very, um, very, very communist family in, um, in the 50s in Los Angeles, and it's very heavily surveilled, and she's sort of forced to, to be with this guy who she feels nothing for just because he's a part of this movement. And I think it's so true for her, and I think it's, it is really true for a lot of my characters. And I think this, this desire to escape and to have this this different life or this different identity is such a is such a huge thematic thing um, for so many of the people I'm writing about. Um, and for me, it's not something that I feel. I mean, I have a really supportive family, so you know, for example, like I, I was I've always been allowed to date whoever I would like to, to date and to write whatever I would like to write and to choose whatever career I'd be interested in. But I know that that's kind of a new thing, and I think that. I think that that feeling of feeling stuck is something that is so, it feels really touching to me, and I just know other people who have, who have been, been through that, and also older generations of my family who just didn't have as many choices as I did. So I think there's that, and I think there's also, there's a part of me that wonders if there's something really comforting in that. Like, you know, as I wrote these stories, I kept thinking about, well, what if, might there be something really nice about being in such a tight community, and in some ways you might feel suffocated, but you also will have this incredible safety net of people who support and love you, and... And just, I think that sort of tension and that question that I've had for myself my whole life just was coming out thematically. It does come up in a couple of different stories in terms of people involved in the Communist Party and the more religious, um, in that story that, that the book opens with, there is conversation about how a religious community can um, be a strong support for you while other characters feel like it could be suffocating. So that really does come into play. And I mm -hmm. you know, have heard from both sides, that it can be nice to have fewer choices. You know, we're in a world now where we have so many choices, and I think human brain is supposed to be able to tolerate maybe seven at a time before it starts getting confused. Um, so those, those kinds of things actually could be helpful. Um, so in another, uh, for a bad choice, 
Um, I know it's terrible to ask an author to choose one piece to, of work over another. So it's a hard one, but for a book club that might choose to only read one story out of the collection, since some book clubs feel like discussing the entire book might be too much for you know a one-hour session, which one would you recommend they read and, and why? I think the last story in the book called Retrospective, um, it was the last story that I wrote, and so that was the only story where I had the rest of the book in mind when I wrote it. And so it, you know, it, the, the book spans, you know, three continents, as I, as I said earlier. But with that that story in particular, it it, it um, lands in the U.S. and Eastern Europe and in Israel all in one story, and um and it's multi generational. It looks at three generations of family. So I think it's probably the most novelistic of the stories. So it might just be kind of the juiciest one for a book club to talk about. And, um, and I think because it's the last one that I wrote, it's still incredibly alive to me, and I'm still really wondering about these characters and what happened to them um, after after the story ended. So I would just be curious to talk to people about what they think has happened to these people. Yeah, I actually was had, when I remember reading it, one of the questions that I had was, um, the book ends talking about um, loneliness and, and creating a language for it. And I was wondering if that, if you felt like that, is actually an ending for the book in addition to the story, or really just for that particular story? Oh, I definitely thought about it as an ending for the book. And I should say, um, earlier when you were asking me about putting together the collection, I always knew that story would go last because because this idea of of, um, of you know of using language and using narrative to shape the the scariest parts of our lives and to control it through language um, is is probably one of the reasons that I write and one of the reasons that I read and so it felt really kind of exciting and very fitting to finish it to end a book in that way and for for the reader to have that moment of thinking okay like here are all sort of here is all all of the infinite possibilities of this you know of the, of, of the sadness and the loneliness and the questioning that these characters have felt and yet here at the end here is a character who has no more words for what he feels and it's almost like there's nothing left to say for the kind of emptiness and the confusion that he feels and that just felt so poignant and so heartbreaking to me. Absolutely. Um, when you're talking about reading on your, you know, your own reading and what you find in that, for either one of the book that complemented Gun Americans, either a book as sort of background source in some way, some context, or something to read comparatively against the stories, do you have a book, a thought of a book or two that might um, be good? Oh, definitely. Um, the writer who has been the most important to me, kind of just even began, before I began writing, and whose voice has been in my head, and she sort of sat on my shoulders the whole time, is Grace Paley. So I would say her collected stories, I mean, just in every way, those stories have been so influential to me and so inspiring. And um, in terms of a, another book, um, Edith Perlman is another writer I really, really admire. And and her, she has a collected stories that came out a couple years ago called Binocular Vision. And one of the things that I, I really love about the book and might be interesting to um, to think about in comparison to mine is that her stories are also on the longer side, and they also um, move across continents and across history. So I feel like her book is pretty globe trotting in that way, and it's really it was really exciting for me to discover her. And um, she was one of the writers who really inspired me to think like, okay, this is. I can think about like a thematic connection between my stories rather than something a bit more literal. Great. Molly, I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up, but thank you so much. For oh, anyone who's interested, so um, Molly is one of our authors who's available through the National Jewish Book Club um, for conversations like this with individual book clubs, so you can certainly contact us about that. Um, and um, you should all, if you haven't read it, on American. This is the hardcover and it's also available in paperback. Molly, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's right after work for a lot of people um, on your coast and getting later in the evening on ours. Um, so thank you again and if you have any questions please contact Jewish Book Council. Um, you can reach us at the website below, um, jewishbookcouncil.org or bookclub at jewishbooks.org. Thank you so much. Thank Good night. You. Good night.